Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, What's Your Poison seminar series organised by the Hera funded uh, research project Intoxicating Spaces. Uh, today's instalment is, of course, cocaine, and we're beyond thrilled uh, to welcome as our speaker, uh, Dr. Douglas Small. Uh, Douglas is lecturer in English literature at Edge Hill University, where he has been since earlier this year. Uh, he's a specialist in 19th century and early 20th century literature and culture. Um, and is especially interested in the history of medicine and science in this period, with a particular focus on the representation of drugs, their use and abuse. Uh, his research and publications cover areas such as the depiction of Sherlock Holmes's cocaine habit, the history of eugenics, fin de siècle understandings of medicine and magic, and the Victorian origins of sports doping. Um, so before we get going, our usual uh, little bit of housekeeping, uh, Douglas will speak for around half an hour, give or take, and they'll, they'll then be around the same time for questions and discussion. Uh, there is a little chat feature in the bottom right, say uh, hello, where you're very welcome to post uh, constructive comments and observations throughout the talk. Um, but if you have a question for Douglas, uh, please use the separate ask a question button at the bottom. Um, and you can pop questions in there uh, as they occur to you throughout the talk, uh, or you can save them up uh, until the end. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to turn things over to Douglas and Cocaine Zany, Cocaine uh, in the Sherlock Holmes stories and their parodies. Take it away, Douglas. Thank you. Hang on. I will just share my screen here before we get started. OK, can everyone see the slides OK? Yep, looking good. Great. All right, well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me along to talk about Sherlock Holmes and cocaine. Um, and basically, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to split this talk into uh, two parts. In the first section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the representation of cocaine in Arthur Conan Doyle's original Sherlock Holmes stories. And then the second half, I'm going to sort of follow on that, that up on that a little bit and sort of examine the ways in which uh, various kind of contemporary caricatures and parodies of the Sherlock Holmes stories engage with and reframe the great detective's cocaine habit for their own ends. Uh, along the way, we're going to have uh, Douglas Fairbanks, a particularly unusual species of rocking chair and probably considerably more cocaine than the average person could take and survive. So hopefully this will be something of a fun ride. Um, to begin with then, uh, Sherlock Holmes could almost certainly claim to be uh, the most famous fictional cocaine user of the 19th century. And traditionally, uh, Holmes's cocaine habit has been critically interpreted as an expression of his uh, exotic or bohemian sensibilities. Uh, in relation to The Sign of Four, the work that includes the most detailed description of Holmes's consumption of cocaine, the contention is most often that the drug represents a kind of colonial corruption of his body in much the same way as the Agra treasure and the novel's villain, uh, the Anglo-Indian returnee Jonathan Small, represent foreign infiltrations into the British homeland. What I want to argue today, though, is that Arthur Conan Doyle represents Sherlock's cocaine habit as being intimately bound up with his working life and with the rigorous single-mindedness of his professional focus. Strange as it might sound, cocaine, rather than representing an indulgence or an addiction that diverts Holmes away from his work, actually indicates the extent to which Holmes's personality is intensely, almost technologically optimized for the business of detection. And in a similar vein, I also want to suggest that the Holmes parodies of the fin de siècle and beyond afford us a rare opportunity to examine the figuration of drug use as a comic trope in this period. Uh, in caricaturing Sherlock Holmes's cocaine habit, Victorian writers hit upon a way of engaging with drug use outside of the more conventional paradigms of moral uh, condemnation and the dread of addiction. These Holmes parodies, I want to argue, offer a means under the, the veil of comedy, for Victorian and Edwardian writers to talk more lightheartedly about the desire for drugs and to imagine the possible joys of their unrestrained consumption. So with that in mind then, I'm just gonna kick off by giving you uh, some very brief details about the wider cultural position that cocaine occupied during the period in which Arthur Conan Doyle was writing. Firstly, it's important to note that in the 1890s, cocaine was still a relatively recent innovation and was widely regarded as a new cutting edge application of medical science. Although the pure cocaine alkaloid had been extracted from coca leaves as early as the 1860s, 
cocaine only really enters the public consciousness in 1884 when it's discovered that it can be used as the first effective local anesthetic. Um, incidentally, 1884 was also um, the year that the first prototype of the espresso machine was patented. So if you very seriously just needed to wake the hell up, 1884 was a very good year for you. Um, but in consequence of this, cocaine was, uh, you know, this discovery of local anesthesia. Cocaine was extremely quickly embraced by both medical practitioners and by the lay press as a transformative and even epoch-making medical discovery. Henry Power of the uh, British Medical Association wrote that, in the discovery of cocaine, a new era seems to have dawned. In 1885, uh, the Dublin Journal of Medical Sciences twice yearly report on materia medica and therapeutics concluded that with such a wonderful and profound character so suddenly acquired, cocaine seems practically to have sprung into existence fully armed for a great amount of future good in the art of medicine. Already it has been applied to many purposes and it is far too well tried to be classified with the doubtful novelties of the time or to have an uncertain importance in the future. And the Dublin Journal sense that cocaine had, uh, you know, the sense that it had sprung into existence fully armed, ascribes something of an almost divine resonance to this new compound. Cocaine appears like a splendid new Athena bursting from the forehead of a Zeus-like 19th century innovation. And this sense of intense technological newness, or even uh, sacredness, gives us an important background for understanding cocaine's conclusion in The Sign of Four, the second Sherlock Holmes novel published in 1890. The first lines of the novel describe Sherlock Holmes taking his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case and preparing to inject himself with a 7% solution of the drug. Watson, concerned about the possible uh, physical costs of his friend's cocaine use, asks him why he should, for a mere passing pleasure, risk the loss of those great powers with which he has been endowed. And Holmes's response is an interesting one. Holmes says, uh, he answers Watson by saying, I suppose that uh, its influence is physically a bad one. I find it, however, so transcendentally stimulating and clarifying to the mind that its second reaction is a matter of small moment. My mind, he said, rebels at stagnation. Give me problems, give me work, and then I'm in my own proper atmosphere. I can dispense with artificial stimulants. That is why I've chosen my own particular profession, or rather created it, for I am the only one in the world. And at first blush, uh, this passage might sound like the hedonistic disregard of the addict. But Doyle has Watson assume that Holmes takes cocaine for pleasure specifically so that Holmes can reject the idea. Holmes instead emphasizes that it is his mind which rebels at stagnation and that cocaine is merely an artificial replacement for his proper work of detection. In this context, it's worth observing how rapidly Holmes's explanation of his drug habits segues into a discussion of the nature of his work. Holmes affirms that he takes cocaine for the same reason that he has chosen his own particular profession, the profession of private uh, or consulting detective, because both activities fundamentally satisfy his needs, which are not the needs of the appetite rather, but the needs of the intellect. And Doyle reinforces this point in later Holmes stories. Holmes, Watson tells us in uh, The Adventure of the Yellow Face, only makes occasional use of cocaine. And he only turned to the drug as a protest against the monotony of existence when cases were scanty and the papers uninteresting. So strange as it might seem then, uh, cocaine actually functions in the early Holmes canon as a symbol of Holmes's indifference to bodily pleasure. Cocaine is a means by which to depict Holmes as a man who is devoted to a sort of intellectual and professional hermitage someone who is so preoccupied with the business of work and with the work of his mind that he turns to cocaine only as a protest against the absence of productive exertion. The great detective's cocaine habit is not presented to us as a distraction from work, but as a compensation for the monotony produced by work's temporary absence. And contemporary reviews of The Sign of Four seem to have been largely unfazed by its hero's casual cocaineism, 
Those critics who did draw attention to the drug appear to have taken their cue from the detective's own uh, explanations and been intrigued by the notion that Holmes's proclivity for cocaine really signals his passion for work. Uh, for example, we might look at the review in The Graphic, uh, which observed that Doyle's hero must either be engaged in unraveling a first-class mystery or in consoling himself for the want of one with cocaine. And indeed, so totally does Holmes appear to be aligned with his own particular profession that Watson more than once suggests that there might be something mechanistic in the extent of his friend's specialization or professional optimization. In the opening lines of A Scandal in Bohemia, for example, the story immediately following the sign of four, Watson describes, uh, sorry, describes Holmes as possessing a cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, Watson says, I take it, the most perfect observing and reasoning machine that the world has ever seen. This introduction similarly juxtaposes uh, Watson's marriage and home-centered enjoyments with Sherlock's professionally oriented life in Baker Street, alternating, as it says, from week to week between cocaine and ambition. Human emotion, Watson imagines, would only affect homes like grit in a sensitive instrument or a crack in one of his own high-powered lenses. A comparison that suggests that Sherlock is perhaps best understood as another such instrument of detection himself, though one which is infinitely more elaborate and finely attuned than any microscope or chemical apparatus. I'll take a drink of water here. So just to recap quickly then, these are the main aspects of how cocaine appears in the Sherlock Holmes stories. Because of its contemporary association with a particularly intense brand of uh, technological modernity and advancement, cocaine functions as an especially vivid way of conveying Holmes's complete devotion to his work, as well as his highly technologized near cybernetic adaptation for that work. And these are also the main points that later comedians and comic authors respond to and parodically, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, parodically, <laughs> let's pronounce the word there, parodically elaborate on. Holmes represents a particularly distinctive and in fact, I would suggest probably unique figure in Victorian drug discourse. He's an immensely popular character who takes enormous quantities of his drug of choice, yet who remains largely immune to those drugs ill effects. Aside from one, I would suggest slightly half-hearted aside in The Adventure of the Missing Three Quarter, which incidentally, I'm more than happy to talk about in detail later on if anyone wants to ask about it in questions. Um, Doyle never seriously engages with the possibility that Holmes might become addicted to cocaine. His highly professionalized engagement with the drug allows him to consume as much as he likes without any suggestion that he will ever become completely dependent on it. As such, uh, Holmes's cocaine habit offered Victorian and early 20th century authors a particularly distinctive avenue to imaginatively experiment with patterns of drug taking. Rather than condemning the immorality of the great detective's cocaineism, as we might perhaps expect, the many Sherlock Holmes parodies that appeared over the following decades convert this marker of Holmes's professional industriousness into the thrill of eagerly self-indulgent and consequence-free consumption. Watson might compare Holmes to a sensitive instrument or a high-powered lens focused solely on the business of detection. But what if that lens were entrained instead on the art of pleasure? What if the transformative discoveries of modern medicine and modern medical science were to be directed towards indulgence rather than towards industry? The parodic framing affords these works, I would suggest, license to speculate about the kinds of Byzantine pharmacological amusements and post-human pleasures that might be possible for an individual more akin to, in Doyle's words, a machine rather than a man. And over the following decades, uh, multitudes of uh, Sherlock Holmeses, Herlock Sholmeses, Sherlock Joneses appeared, all hungrily wolfing down cocaine in 7%, 70%, and 700% solutions, gleefully doled out from buckets, bicycle pumps, and casks. When, in the pages of uh, the Great Farnhouse Herald, for example, Inspector Pinkeye of Scotland Yard comes to visit the arch detective of Shaker Street, 
He can confidently expect the generous offer to take a cigarette, my dear Pink Eye, and a gallon of cocaine. Uh, similarly, in 1899's uh, The Dryhoff Poisoning Case, Dr. Batson finds his friend seated before the fire in his favorite rocker taking laudanum through a straw, while a simple device, operated by the motion of the chair, injected morphine into his arm as he rocked. When the day's work is done, Holmes casually mixes himself a cocktail of laudanum and cocaine garnished with an opium cherry. Uh, the apogee of this kind of uh, Holmesian technological hedonism is probably the 1916 uh, silent film comedy, The Mystery of the Leaping Fish which stars Douglas Fairbanks as um, a kind of very thinly veiled Holmes parody called Coke Any Day, uh, the world's greatest scientific detective. The first shot of uh, the film uh, shows Any Day's office with an enormous cake tin sized canister of cocaine sitting on the corner of his desk. Likewise, across his chest, Coke any day wears a bandolier of uh, syringes from which he regularly injects himself. Fairbanks does this at least three times in the first 90 seconds of the film, uh, grinning hugely and casually chucking aside the spent hypodermics afterwards. In between doses, uh, Coke's butler makes use of the flat's extensive chemical apparatus to mix his master a cocktail of gin, laudanum and prussic acid, which he dispenses into the detective's open mouth using an enormous um, syringe-like hand pump. Coke Any Day spends the last third of the film, uh, according to an intertitle, full of hop, after polishing off an entire brick of raw opium that he discovers at a crime scene. So Any Day's progress through the film is then accompanied by a constantly evolving parade of different substances and different means of consumption. He is apparently never more than a moment away from smoking, eating, drinking, injecting, or sniffing something psychoactive. And later on in the film, uh, Coke overcomes the villain's henchman by the application of, um, well, what I can probably best describe as a kind of cocaine judo. As each man tries to attack him, the detective adroitly seizes their arm and pricks them with a hypodermic. Overcome by sudden massive infusions of cocaine, uh, the men cartwheel their way out of windows or vibrate their way off the ground and out of the top of shot, never to be seen again. And if you just give me one second here, I can show you the relevant scene. There's our hero. And yoink. And we just skip forward a couple of seconds. It happens again. And there we go. So um, <laughs> in this way, Coke Any Day proceeds throughout the film. And in fact, it sort of suggests through life in a perpetual haze of invulnerable, hyperactive and coked up exuberance. For Arthur Conan Doyle, Holmes's character could be summed up in the image of the detective as uh, a calculating machine industriously oscillating between cocaine and ambition. By contrast, though, the Holmes caricatures encode the jaunty seductiveness of a life lived on an unashamed and perpetual bender. I want to finish off by uh, suggesting that these parodies similarly upend Arthur Conan Doyle's carefully constructed relationship between Holmes's cocaine habit and his work. While Doyle's Holmes is presented to us as a kind of fantasy of instinctive and unflagging professional energy, a man whose chosen profession aligns perfectly with the demands of his life, his mind, and his selfhood, the Holmes parodies articulate an equally appealing, though much less respectable, fantasy. That merely pretending to work, 
or play acting the superficialities of work might end up being just as profitable as actual labor. As an example of this, we might consider Frank Richardson's 1905 comic novel, The Secret Kingdom. Finding himself in the grip of a particularly perplexing family mystery, the novel's hero, Paul Peterson, takes the natural step of rushing to London to consult the eminent detective of Baker Street. When he arrives, however, Holmes seems much more easily distracted than Paul had envisaged from the stories he's read in the Strand magazine. Watson seems to regard his flatmate with an eye that is more, in uh, the words of the novel, professional and friendly. When Holmes withdraws for a moment, however, Watson takes the opportunity to disclose the truth to Paul. According to Watson, the case is very simple, but very sad. My poor friend's mind is totally unhinged. Years ago, he became a victim to cocaine. And while under the influence of the drug, his brain involved extraordinary criminal mysteries. Of course, they stood in no kind of relation to life, but they had a certain fascination of their own, at any rate, to me, his friend. To humor him, I wrote them down. And as you are aware, they had a considerable vogue with the public. The whole thing, the crimes, the criminals, the arrests, all inventions, the marvelous inventions of a shattered brain. Watson, it says, was overcome with emotion. And Paul asks, except of course the deerstalker cap. Well, except that of course, but the wearing of that sort of cap is in itself a symptom of disease. So this passage then uh, sort of impishly reframes the assumed relationship between excessive drug use and work. Uh, so that the pleasures of unrestrained cocaineism end up leading to unexpectedly profitable outcomes. Uh, rather than wrecking his career, Holmes's excessive indulgence has in fact been the making of him. Watson too has managed to come out ahead in spite of his lack of ability. Paul indignantly accuses Watson of having relinquished his duty as a doctor and made capital out of the terrible condition of his poor friend. And Watson shamefacedly responds, yes, in a sense, but I am not precisely, what shall I say, a great genius. In fact, I often think that I am something of a, can I say it, a chump head? So this configuration um, upends what John Tosh refers to as the sort of characteristically Victorian valorization of work as both a moral duty and as a personal fulfillment. Here, paid remuneration and productivity come not from a firm commitment to work and to the rectitudinous ethics of work, but from performing something that looks enough like work to pass muster and to deceive the uninitiated. Watson is a chump head who has bumbled into creating a publishing sensation from his friend's drug delusions. Holmes is a cocaine fiend who dresses loudly enough, so loudly in fact that his deerstalker hat can be recognized as a symptom of disease, and acts confidently enough to convince the public that he is the greatest detective the world has known. In The Secret Kingdom, then, both Holmes and Watson are moral and professional failures, but they carry their cocaineism and chump-headedness to such consummate degrees that they wind up profiting from them anyway. In this way, the Holmes parodies uh, seemingly express an element of longing behind their sort of humorous facade. Under the aegis of comedy, these works gesture towards a subversive and probably ultimately unrealizable ideal. That acts of indulgence, play, drug taking and pretense might lead to the same productive outcomes as industry and temperance. Arthur Conan Doyle's Holmes represents a, a sort of complex synthesis between the apparently opposing poles of work life and drug life. And contemporary Holmes parodies execute a similar synthesis but with their moral and ideological emphases provocatively inverted. Um, so that is it from uh, the talk. And thank you all very much for listening. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have uh, afterwards. Thank you. Oh. There we go. Let's put that back on. So, so Doug, I'll just stop you all screen sharing. Douglas, sure. yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, appropriately stimulating and uh, beautifully structured and, uh, and and written talk. It really was uh, immaculately constructed. Um, and uh, yeah, questions uh, into the box, please, um, as they uh, if if you have any. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just particularly struck with this notion of um, Holmes as what I think in contemporary drug 
circles and terminology would be a chipper um someone who someone who's able to basically occasionally enjoy recreationally um mm. becoming um a wholesale um a wholesale addict um i have a question um about how um sort of widespread uh, generally um cocaine use was uh, mm. in um sort of culture in this period i mean was there such a thing as as the late 19th century cokehead did that exist <laughs> It, it's difficult, I think, to tell exactly how widespread it was as a recreational drug. Um, it's, it's in some ways part of the reason it's difficult is because most of the ways in which I think people would have encountered it would have been through cold remedies or seasickness remedies, mm -hmm. because cocaine, certainly from the 1890s onwards, is used very much the way we would kind of use paracetamol now, in that because it's a painkiller, it's a vasoconstrictor, and it's a stimulant. It actually makes a very good um, like cold and flu remedy. Mm -hmm. So there certainly seems to be in the discourse a lot of concern about the possibility of people beginning to take cocaine recreationally as a result of these kinds of very widely available remedies. Um, and certainly there is at least one source which does directly um, there's a story which is told by like a, there's a professor at Edinburgh University who in one of his lectures he tells the story about being called to a house um, to deal with a very sick young man and when he arrives the, the patient's sister the first thing she says to him is oh, oh doctor it's all the fault of that terrible book <laughs> and she, investigation proves that the young man is like uh, is taking enormous quantities of cocaine and that he's been inspired to do this by reading the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. So there, there seems to be a lot of concern in, in the discourse about people taking it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a lot of people probably either did take it sort of semi recreationally because it was so easily available, as I've said, in a lot of like over the counter medications, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it feels like Holmes's like pattern of drug consumption would have been very unusual even at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank and you. Certainly, and... just, sorry, just as a sort of tangent on that to follow up on, certainly um, taking uh, coca wines or cocktails or various other kinds of infusions that contained either extract of coca leaves or simply small quantities of cocaine as stimulants would have been very common. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Douglas. Someone's popped a question in the box. Let's look at this. It's from uh, it's from our own Phil Withington. Uh, he says, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Uh, is the film accessible? Um, he asked, maybe uh, let us know afterwards. Um, he's a few questions, but just to ask two, um, he was wondering about the cultural work that other intoxicants do in Doyle's work uh, and pastiches of compared to cocaine. Uh, I mean, his sort mm. of pipe smoking, for example, I guess would be the foremost example. Uh, and secondly, is there evidence of Doyle's personal relationship to cocaine? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot you could say about, well, okay, I'll take your questions in order. Um, first of all, the, the film is available on YouTube. There's all there's an older edition which is um, which has just been scanned from uh, whatever print was available, so that's a little bit muckier. There's more kind of grain in it, and there's a restored edition which I think was uploaded around about 2004, 2003 maybe. Um, so it's available both in high def and lower def versions on YouTube. Um, but yeah, um, I mean there is a lot you can say about different intoxicants in Doyle's work. And certainly uh, Susan Zeger, for example, has done a lot of work on um, Holmes's taking of tobacco and how that kind of, in her reading, connects with his um, his sort of compulsive consumption of, of print literature and to his sort of what, what she reads as a kind of media addiction almost. Um, certainly it does seem as if uh, I mean, certainly, even if you if you see the little like image that I had up of Sher of Herlock Sholmes, where he's smoking two pipes simultaneously, mm -hmm. it does feel like cocaine and tobacco are probably Holmes's two main drugs of choice. Um, and there is a, a direct relationship which is often drawn between Holmes's taking of tobacco and his sort of intense thought processes. There's a lot of scenes in like Hand the Baskervilles, for example, where 
when Watson comes back into the room after Holmes has been working for a while, he finds the room like completely like thick with tobacco smoke. And Holmes says that he finds like a, a concentrated atmosphere, like helps him think better. Um, that a concentrated atmosphere, I think his line is that it helps concentrated thought. So there's definitely a parallel there between, um, I think tobacco represents a slightly different relationship than cocaine because cocaine seems to be a drug that Holmes only uses when he has no work available to him as a way to keep himself stimulated. Whereas tobacco seems to be a drug that Holmes takes in order to help himself to do his work. He similarly consumes lots of coffee for the same reason. Mm. Um, and as well, I, I suppose you, you can certainly contrast it with the representation of opium in things like The Man with the Twisted Lip, um, which I actually think draws a very distinct contrast between the opium addicts in the kind of um, the, the opium den, essentially, that Watson goes to find his patient in, if you're familiar with that story, and Holmes' own cocaine habit. I think though that there are actually elements in that story which clearly differentiate those. Um, but I mean, I can, I can talk more about that if, if you're interested. Um, I don't know. Has, does, does that address, address your question? Um, um, yep, it's, it certainly covers the uh, the first one. Um, and to move on, uh, thank you, uh, Douglas. And to move on, sorry, that was a slightly long winded answer there. No, 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 no. It was it was, it was brilliant. That was absolutely fantastic. Thanks, um, and there was a second part to Phil's question, which was: Is there any evidence of Doyle's personal relationship? Yeah, thank you. Um, not that I've been able to find. Um, in fact, it, I'd also my suspicion is from the way it's represented in the texts, I think that Doyle probably was basing his representation of cocaine almost entirely on reports of it and on its sort of broader representation in the media more generally as a, a cutting edge, like new innovation. Because there are, there are incidents like, for instance, and this is something that the parodies pick up on in a big way, that, um, in the opening chapter of The Sign of Four, Holmes sort of is having this conversation with Watson. He starts by taking an injection of cocaine. Then Watson asks him if he would mind like um, examining a, a watch that he gives him as a sort of test of his abilities. And Holmes's response to this is to say, well, yes, absolutely. In fact, that would that would prevent me from having to take another dose of cocaine. And this is charitably speaking about 10 minutes after he's just injected himself. And Watson describes that Holmes has apparently been injecting himself with cocaine at least several times a day for many months. And I think that that density of consumption is is such that I don't think Doyle could have been familiar with its effects at first hand, at least not in the kinds of dosages that he's representing Holmes taking it in. Be because really that is like that's an extreme amount of of cocaine to take over a, over a protracted period. Brilliant, thank you, uh, thank you, Douglas, and thank you, Phil. Um, I also had a question about the um, the sort of the, the ways and means by which cocaine was was ingested um, in this period, because obviously now mm -hmm. we tend to think of sort of uh, in its lines of white powder, um, but obviously this this wasn't the case here, uh, and I was actually mm -hmm. a little sort of surprised. So I'm not a 19th centuryist myself. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see um, sort of syringes um, and sort of hypodermic needles featuring so prominently. Mm -hmm. um, you say a little bit more about these um the, the various sort of way yeah the ways and means by which it was um so the, the mode of application is is actually quite interesting and as you say we, we're now much more familiar with insufflation or inhalation of mm -hmm. cocaine yeah. right yeah. um certainly in in the 19th century that the and um, really i think up until sort of almost the 1910s mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. main way you would take cocaine would either be, as I've said, um, by by drinking it in a liquid solution mm -hmm. uh, or in uh, voice lozenges are very, very popular and widely known. As, as I said before, seasickness remedies, cold and flu remedies. Um, these are all quite common means of availability. And if you're sort of wanting to take it recreationally or as a stimulant, then an injection seems to be the most common way to do that. Um, this starts to kind of shift, as I said, around about 1910, where you start to get inhalation of powdered cocaine. And that originates in 
cocaineized snuffs again taken mostly as cold remedies where you would sort of mix cocaine with um sort of ground menthol or um <clears throat> there's one recipe i've seen which suggests mixing it with powdered coffee and, and ground sugar so for, for a lively kick um and so that starts to change about 1910 and what's interesting about that actually is that it's I have some material on this in, in my book, which hopefully will address this more in detail, but um, it's, it's quite heavily racialized in that it is suggested that in a lot of American and British sources that this um, move from injection or drinking to like inhalation of powdered cocaine is um, something which has originated in black American populations in the Southern states of America and has subsequently kind of spread into the emerging drug underground of the early 20th century. And there are a lot of very uh, pejorative reporting of that and highly racist reporting of that, which suggests that this uh, new discovery of like inhaling cocaine um produces a much more powerful and destructive high than merely injecting or drinking it which actually is, is is not accurate because if you inject cocaine that does produce a much more intense and long-lasting uh reaction than simply inhaling it which is like the effect comes on more quickly but it also is less intense and passes off more quickly as i understand from what i've read on this subject um so there is that sense of this as something which is kind of a dangerous racially inflected innovation in this sort of like technology of drug taking um th does again does that kind of answer your question or would you like me to say more about that or anything like oh no but, but, but please it answers it but but please please say more if you've if you've got some um because this, um, this is absolutely fascinating i had no idea that it was around 1910 that there was this shift to the um to the powdered variety and that it was such a racialized yeah. course well i i mean i think as well one significant factor behind that shift is that a it's a lot more convenient mm -hmm. um and cocaine essentially throughout the early 20th century begins to spread from being a um as I said, a drug which is taken mostly through injection, which of course requires access to syringes and mm. much more cumbersome to something which can be taken uh, by inhalation, which is much more amenable to being taken in a sort of social setting or even in kind of like a work setting. It's much easier to kind of like pop to the bathroom in a nightclub mm. or something like that mm. than to have to manage a hypodermic syringe and things. Um, so again, this shift towards powdered cocaine taking sort of fuels its transformation into what we now think of it as, which is almost like the quintessential party drug. Mm -hmm. But it's something that can be taken easily and conveniently in social settings. Um, it's available as a powder from chemists in small cardboard boxes. And there are lots of reports of nightclubs or um streets in sort of london and manchester and in paris and places like that of, of um night venues being just f full of these tiny cardboard boxes that have been discarded after people have used it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating um, I'll, I'll move on douglas because more sure. um uh questions have have popped into the box uh phil is squeezing in another one um he says that clearly the parody suggests that holmes is identified with cocaine uh, does that indicate that he's unusual in his habits or is it a common uh or increasing trope of popular culture at the time so this is one of the questions which i think it is it is somewhat tricky to answer this and most of my work focuses on like the discourses of drug use and the way they're represented in fiction and in the press rather than on sort of first-hand experiences of actual drug use um but yes there is some evidence to suggest that certainly up until the 1910s or the early 1910s early 1900s and this shift toward um a much more convenient and widespread mode of application um that cocaine use is comparatively uncommon and it's something which can be identified with um sherlock holmes specifically as a kind of feature of his character interestingly um 
is a kind of kind of follow up to what I was talking about before with the sort of um, the Edinburgh Doctor and this there's a, there's a growing kind of discourse in the early 20th century and in the very late 19th century um, that sort of suggests that Doyle is somehow kind of culpable for promoting the habit of cocaine taking or that there's a risk that people might increasingly turn towards taking this drug as a result of wanting to emulate Sherlock Holmes. And, and I strongly suspect that this is why um, when uh, Doyle sort of resurrects Holmes for the return of Sherlock Holmes and for subsequent work, that he, he sticks in this sort of strange little paragraph at the beginning of uh, the Adventure of the Missing Three Quarter, which sort of half-heartedly acknowledges that Holmes has at some point in the past become, um, it says, I think, something to the effect of that, like, cocaine at some point had threatened to, like, check Holmes's remarkable career and that Watson had had to kind of, like, nurse him through it. But it also frames this as a, like, rest assured, gentle reader, this is over and done with now. So there's no... There's no serious willingness, I think, on the part of, of any of the parodies or even on Doyle's part to like represent Holmes actually suffering the effects of addiction. Um, so, yes, yeah, so just to come back to your original question, I, I think that it is difficult to tell. I There certainly seems to be a lot of concern around growth of cocaine addiction in this period on the part of the press and the medical establishment. And certainly there is a sense that Holmes is widely identified with that with the cocaine habit. There are a couple of references I find where uh, journalists say things like, well, um, most people today know about the that know that there is such a thing as a cocaine habit from reading Sherlock Holmes, which suggests that while it was kind of it, that it was something that was perhaps widely known about in certain small sections of society that doctors and people who were preoccupied with the qu the problems of inebriety of drug habituation were quite strongly concerned about this but that it was something that was maybe not widely diffused into the public if that if that makes sense oh ab absolutely um thank you and i hope that answers your question phil um thank you douglas we've got um another question from gabriel gurian again on sort of the broader uh, culture um, of consumption i suppose and he asks were there evident social distinctions related to the consumption of drugs such as cocaine and opium in victoria london were these substances predominantly ingested by certain social groups in specific places uh, mm. opium for example or were they uh, disseminated seamlessly between the classes as recreational and addicted uh, addictive habits right i mean so i know less about opium but certainly what is interesting is that there's a very well documented um percept or shift in perception as i said around about the early 20th century where what is conceived of as the problem of cocaine addiction goes from being viewed as being a, a distinctively middle class problem to being a problem of working class or sort of criminal underclass groups mm -hmm. Certainly in, in late Victorian London, my feeling is that cocaine was viewed as being much more of a middle class issue than um, opium consumption, which, again, I, I know much less about opium. So this is like my kind of sense of it from reading other scholars, which was more broadly diffused across social classes and was more available. I would, I mean, my feeling is that cocaine is often equated with morphine use rather than with opium use, because these are both kind of technological um, drugs that are slightly more expensive, that require specialized equipment and knowledge in the form of syringes to use recreationally. Um, so I, I, my feeling is that there is that there is that differentiation between opium and cocaine, and obviously there are other. The two drugs have have very different connotations in terms of their effects and how they're used and the kinds of like the kinds of desires that the drugs are imagined to fulfil and provoke in people. 
like oh, just, I mean, just on a very basic level, opium is widely viewed as being um, a drug of dreamers and like a drug for like imaginative stimulation and relaxation and for encountering kind of visionary dreamy experiences. Whereas cocaine as a stimulant is much more viewed as being something that um, you could potentially fall into as it were by accident from wanting to take cocaine to help you do work, be more productive, work longer hours, especially if you were what we would now call a white collar worker. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, I mean, this is a very widely commented upon strand of drug discourse in this period, but people in the medical profession, doctors, nurses, dentists, practitioners of all stripes are, are much more widely viewed as being, uh, or are seen as being much more susceptible to the dangers of uh, opium or sorry, not opium, uh, but morphine or cocaine addiction because of the like intense professional demands that are placed on them and because they have ready access to these drugs. Um, so does that kind of address your question or, or uh, is there more that you would like to, to chat about that with? I, mean, I don't know how Gabriel feels, but that seemed very comprehensive to me. <laughs> to cool. me Doug. Thank you, thanks, so thanks. Gabriel. And thank you for the, for the great question, uh, Gabriel. Actually, we've got another really good one from Nesca. I was going to ask this. Um, she says, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, would you have come across mention of how Holmes would have gotten access uh, to his cocaine um, or explain the, the, what was the sort of supply chain um, for this? Right. OK, so this is never commented on in the actual Holmes stories. Um, but on the other hand, it was not a terribly difficult drug to obtain. You could order it relatively easily from pharmacists. Certainly um, in the 1890s, uh, cocaine is, um, God, it sounds so weird to say this, cocaine is cheap and plentiful. Like it, it's, there, there's a there's an incredible kind of like price explosion that happens around about the early to mid 1880s when it is discovered that it can be used as an anesthetic where there's a there's a brief period where by weight i think cocaine is maybe almost twice as expensive as gold um for a period of time but then certainly by the 1890s the, the price has very much declined and it's available in you know, it's because it is such a widely used compound in home medicines and in various kinds of surgeries. Um, there, are, there are basically no restrictions on how available it is. So although it's never really specifically talked about as a logistical thing in the home stories, I also don't think it would have presented much of a problem for homes to access cocaine. Hey, brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you, Douglas. And thank you, uh, Nesca. Um, uh, and Phil has another one. Uh, you mentioned, mentioned espresso. How did Holmes take his coffee? Uh, right. Again, from descriptions in the stories, it sounds like Holmes probably was drinking coffee from essentially from like a coffee pot. Like um, the, the espresso thing, I will say, is like there are some technicalities about the, the, the espresso thing. What, what was patented in 1884 is, as I said, the first prototype of the espresso machine. So it was a, a means by which to produce coffee using a concentrated coffee using a steam boiler. So it wasn't what we would now think of as espresso proper, but it was a means by which you could inject steam through coffee to like produce it quickly and in a slightly more concentrated form so it seems to i'm not again not a historian of espresso or, or of coffee really but the conception seems to have been that it was almost a slightly automated way of producing larger quantities of coffee more quickly for a coffee bar rather than what we now view as the espresso machine Brilliant. Um, thank you, Douglas, um, and thank you, Phil. Uh, unless there are any more any more questions, um, speak now or forever hold your your peace. Um, on that note, then um, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll wrap up. Um, so yeah, it remains for me to say thank you uh, so much for coming, um, particularly, and particularly to, to you, yeah, to you, Douglas, for, for an endlessly fascinating uh, paper. Um, it really it really was.
Um, and the uh, the seminar series will be back same time, uh, same place um, in a fortnight's time when we'll be hearing from Jonathan Jones. Nice continuity, actually, about um, opiates uh, in antebellum American uh, medicine. Uh, so no doubt lots of similar strands there. Um, and I'll just hang on. I'll pop a little link to the um, to the schedule at the bottom uh, where you can sign up uh, sign up for that uh, but again thank you so much douglas that was absolutely superb thoroughly enjoyed that and uh, yeah thanks everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day cheerio bye, bye.